so there's a few things that we're going to cover. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about data types. We're not going to go into it in massive depth, but again, I would encourage uh, a little bit of further reading just to clarify some of those points. Uh, we're going to hopefully do a practical exercise in visualizing the data. Again, looking at descriptives and what the normal distribution means uh, in terms of describing this data. I'm also going to try and begin to set this in the context of um, the structure used in research reporting. So there's a basic structure that you'll probably be familiar with from school and at university it was probably largely forgotten if you didn't study a scientific course. And in some ways it seems a bit juvenile because it's something you may have learned um, when you were 12 or 13. But actually it's the logical breakdown of research that's used all the way through um, a research career. And so there's nothing juvenile about it. And so the essential structure for reporting your research goes something like this, and there are variations on the theme. We have an introduction that should clearly state the issue in question. It should really set up the problem that you're trying to answer. It should explain to any reader why you're doing what you're doing. It should explain the background. And it should then explain where the gaps in that background knowledge are. And then because of that background um, and the gaps that you've identified, and you've identified why those gaps are important, then it should include a succinct statement of the research question. And we covered the research question last week. So really it should explain what this piece of research is going to address, what problem it is going to address. And the introduction should have no more than that. Then you have a materials and methods section. And this explains how you're going to go about addressing this research question that you've set up in your introduction. And so it explains the experimental methodology you're going to use, or we're going to use. It explains the analytical techniques that are used in um, processing the experimental data. And within that, and part of that analytical techniques, within that, it, uh, you explain the statistical methods, which can be as simple as the results are reported um, graphically, as histograms, for example. It, or it can be the results are presented as means and standard deviations. But you should tell the reader through the method section what's about to come, what was done, what was done both experimentally and analytically. Then we have a results section that sets forth your results as bare facts. It's an objective reporting of the results. So they, you shouldn't include statements such as, um, this was a really big number, or uh, any, anything that expresses your opinion, really sh it has no place in the results. It should have no interpretation. You shouldn't be explaining to people what you think this means and why you think it's wonderful. What you should say is, I measured the height of people 
and the mean was dot dot dot. Not they seemed rather tall because the mean was dot dot dot. That has no place in a results section. A results section is, is the bare facts with no it's purely objective, no subjective interpretation at all, no speculation. It is simply this is what I found. But the discussion is where it all comes alive. And I cannot emphasize enough how important the discussion is. Because this is where you bring together everything that's gone before. You explain the limitations of the methods that you've used. So no experiment's perfect. All experimental work will have limitations. But this is where you explain it. Then coupled into that, you can explain the limitations of the um, analysis, including limitations in the statistical reporting. Um, and that can be things like, in your materials or methods, you showed bar graphs or, or histograms. But you could then explain that the process that you were measuring changes over time, and that time change in nature isn't captured in the histogram, or something like that. And that would be a limitation. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It simply means this is a limitation. And what is more important than trying to get things right is to be open and, um, and very frank about what the limitations of your work are and show and demonstrate that you're aware or we're aware of where the limitations are of the work that we've undertaken. If we can't show that we're aware of the limitations, then it looks like we're saying, I've done the perfect experiment. Everything that I've found is absolute truth, and you should accept it. And that is never true. And then you, you have uh, additional uh, things like, how does this contribute to the wider research field? How does this contribute to other people's understanding? What do I think this means? So why do I say all of this? Yes, this is important. But it also reflects the way that coming back to the exam, and I, I talked a little bit about the exam last week, how that would be structured. So we had a question. And when we examine this, we, we structure the questions in such a, a way that we might ask for you to um, explain the results or discuss something. Um, we will go into this further um, as we go through the course. But what you should be aware of that is that the way the exam questions are structured reflects um, the structure for report and research. So when I ask for a discussion of the results, that is actually you need to start to think about what this might mean. Um, I may just ask for what are the results, and it can be as simple as looking at a table that uh, you've got in front of you and writing down what you see in that table. And it's about knowing that that's what you have to do. And it reflects what we do in real life research. So the idea is that all of these processes we go through in this course are actually reflective of the real research process and hopefully that then feeds into project work. Uh, but of course uh, I need to set up some essential background and this is the point in the course that normally divides people. Uh, I use some Star Wars uh, examples. Now, I am very aware that there will be people here who have absolutely no idea what Star Wars is. And this is uh, this can cause some division because uh, you may feel that you have to go and watch uh, these, these are movies and you may feel you have to go and watch them. Um, and then you may feel you have to do some background reading. And of course that's going to take up valuable time. Now I just use it as a silly example. If you, uh, please don't let it um, distract you. You could replace Star Wars with, with anything else that you find meaningful. But it, 
for me, it makes uh, writing the course slightly more enjoyable. So, here we go. Um, important, note this down. Never know, it could appear in the exam, but it won't. Uh, we have, um, of course, the Star Wars movies are a bit weird because they start with episode four, um, not episode one. And we have the uh, these characters, Luke Skywalker, Walker, Han Solo, Princess Leia, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda. And you're looking at this if you've never seen this before, thinking, what is this guy going on about? This is crazy. Uh, they're basically, it's, it's set in space uh, and there's a, a whole very complicated political situation um, and, uh, and some very powerful individuals that need to overcome the evil emperor. Go and watch it. It's uh, a good de-stressing exercise. Anyway, these, uh, these, these guys are in space. Uh, and so we're aware about th of this. We've watched the movies. Uh, and so we've got some idea of, of some of the language and so, some of what's going on. They live on some planets. Now, suppose we land on one of the planets that's described in one of these movies. And we discover that it's populated. And now all of these, uh, the, these individuals, well, okay, most of these individuals look human-ish. Okay, this one is humanoid, looks a bit like Bigfoot, but um, Chewbacca. And we land on planet, and we decide, having watched the movies, we've got some background, but there are some unknowns. And some of those unknowns might be, what are the basic characteristics of the inhabitants of Tatooine? Tatooine being this planet that we've landed on. And so we need to think to ourselves, well, okay, they look roughly humanoid. How are we gonna find out uh, what their basic characteristics are? Now, you may think the, uh, the space example is, is just silly. But we can apply this to other areas. So, um, was, actually, I didn't introduce Saba. This is Saba sitting at, at the back here, who who was wandering around earlier giving you uh, feedback forms. So she's my partner in crime on this course. And um, if it goes wrong, always blame her. Uh, uh, Saba specialises in dental public health. And so she deals with populations. I don't know if you want to give an example of some population-based research. Sabah likes to bring, bring me down to earth and back to real examples. Uh, 
And from that sound, but in a way, after that, for example, this is the fine sound, but it also concentrates on the construction. And the part of this, uh, this process is in order to the characteristic of the vocation you have reproducing your sense. So, you understand. So I come from a more lab-based background and one of the things that we've ended up doing a lot of measurement is, um, I think of a good example, it's sev several, but uh, I, one thing that we, we looked at actually was um, corrective appliances for overjet and some of you may end up picking up one of these projects. Um, and so what we had was trying to measure whether there was any difference between part-time wearing of an appliance and full-time wearing. And again, so we have a population of people who wear these appliances or could be uh, asked to wear them. And then we have to look at um, finding out whether there's any difference in the outcome between wearing between the part-time and full-time wearing groups and so this idea of having populations doesn't just uh isn't just for public health matters or or looking at people on planets it is actually any area of scientific investigation you can characterize the things that you want to look at as a population and you want to represent that population by a sample of it or a subset um, of it. But back on Tatooine, the, uh, we're looking at the population of the planet and we wish to characterize, um, characterize them. Would anyone like at this point to not leave, um, but to instead to offer an opinion as to what characteristics of an alien population we may wish to uh, to determine. You've landed on this planet and you want to find out uh, more about them. We have one hand, excellent. Have a chocolate. Oh, no. I have lost the chocolates actually. <laughs> Excellent. So we've got some characteristics there that we could that we could look at. And does anyone else have any want to offer? Someone someone started it now. Oh, we've got another hand. Hang on. I'm just going to offer the chocolate. Have a chocolate. Oh, yeah. Oh, you've already taken ten. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Have a chocolate, or you can. Yeah. It better be a good answer, right? Maybe height or weight of the individual, and the gender. Yep. Okay, those are, seem like good characteristics as well: height, weight, gender. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on this? Sorry. The food. Yeah. Have some food. Does anyone feel like me offering chocolates around is far too juvenile? <laughs> I, I would always take uh, chocolates being offered around. I... Okay. Um, you know what? Let's set these off for another round round trip. I'm not sure it'll make it all the way down there though. So, in fact, hang on. I'm going to start at this end this time. Ooh, and I've popped one out for me. There you go. Here you go. You pass them back. <laughs> if you've taken enough provisions to keep you going throughout the session, um, that's fine. Let them pass you by. Okay, so we've come up with some basic characteristics, and that's great. Uh, and we could, in our materials and methods section, we can, we, we then state, we're going to characterize the population by these, these things. And in our discussion, we accept 
that there may be other ways to characterize the population. And in fact, our research may show us that the characteristics that we have chosen aren't necessarily the best. And so in our discussion, we can propose other ways to uh, characterize this population. So I've chosen here some, um, some characteristics. So we've got uh, the weight, the height, the age, the gender, perhaps the alien species. And we could, we could add to these. Uh, as was suggested uh, by some other um, things like socioeconomic status, for example. Now, each of these uh, these items that we're going to look at, these pieces of information, we're going to call these variables. So these are just these are variables. These are things that can vary. So weight, not everyone has the same weight. It's a variable. Well, maybe they do. We don't know, but we're going to find out something we're interested in measuring. Of course, then we have this other question. How many inhabitants should we sample? Uh, if we just find one, are we, do we feel that that one individual is representative of the, uh, the whole planetary population? Few people shaking their heads. No, I, I'd suggest that one, one individual may not be representative. So um, we can think about this a bit further. So let's imagine we've landed our spacecraft on the planet. And although we're very scientifically minded to understand this population, Equally, uh, we suffer from severe cowardice and don't want to venture too far from the spaceship. So we spe send out, um, I know, some lowly PhD students who uh, serve us uh, with questionnaires and we say, quick, go out and sample, just you know, ask the 10 closest people to the spaceship um, to fill out this questionnaire. Are they a representative sample of the planet? Does anyone want to offer an opinion on, to, on the representative nature of the 10 closest individuals uh, from the planet to our spaceship? I see a hand. Go on. Okay. okay, so good discussion point. They may not be representative um, of the whole planet. They may just be for that, from that local area. Uh, imagine a, um, a spaceship were to land um, just outside the Garrod building. Who might we send um, to investigate this spaceship or the people who've come on this spaceship? Some people send me, and that's fine. Um, who else might we send? Would we send um, children from the local school? Probably not. We might do. Um, depends, again, on your feeling about these things, whether you get it through ethics. But you probably wouldn't. Um, so there might be certain people from society that we would send to investigate. So we've landed our spaceship. We sample the 10 closest people to us. But those 10 people, 10 closest people to us or individuals to us, they might be the ones who are sent to investigate us. Uh, and perhaps they're the military or, or the, the equivalent of the police. Perhaps they're all the biggest and the strongest and the fastest and the fittest. So they may not be representative of those around us. And this is what we have to think of when we're doing any experimental work. In any piece of experimental work, whether it's to do with people populations or measuring things in a lab, I know, counting cells, we have to be careful that we're actually taking a representative sample 
and that we can justify why. And when we get to a discussion and we're discussing those limitations, we can say why we feel that we have, or justify what we've done and feel that, okay, these limitations may exist, but this is what we've done to overcome them. Anyway, now for some practical uh, work rather than listen to me rabbit on about spacemen. So we're going to open um, some data in SPSS. So if you go to the QM Plus website, which I have magically before me, um, hopefully you remember how to get there. If you log into QM Plus, um, you are looking for the DIN 7002 course and you can find that just by searching uh, there so you, if you just type in qmplus.qmul.ac.uk and then in the search if it doesn't come up you can type din7002 and they should get the course come up. And if you click on that, if you scroll down, we have statistics data. Under lecture two, we can click on sample of a population, n equals 10. So this is an SPSS file that has some information about this uh, alien population um, but it's a sample size of 10. There are 10, the, the, the characteristics of 10 individuals there. And my hope is you will end up with something that looks like this. I would be very interested to see a show of hands when uh, when you reach a screen like this. Remarkable. So there's a few hands that are down. If it's not working for you, double up with someone around you. Okay. But you can double up anyway. It really doesn't matter. I'd encourage you to group group up. So we've collected the raw data as per our materials and methods. But now we need to visualize this uh, and start to find something out about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some of the functionality of SPSS to achieve this. And remember what I said last week, this course isn't so much about learning SPSS. Um, it is very much about learning how, inter how to interpret the outputs from SPSS, because you can expect in an exam to see a table, an output screen from SPSS and be asked um, to interpret that. And then you need to know how to glean the useful information from, from that. So we do a lot of, okay, this is how you generate those tables. And these are the numbers that are actually of interest and this is what they mean. Sab has just mentioned um, an interesting phenomenon that uh, occurs. If you work in the more social side of dentistry, so dental public health, it would be very common to use SPSS. And you will probably become very familiar with inputting data into it. If you work in a more lab-based discipline, especially if you're on oral biology, you will tend to find um, Excel. Excel's fine for recording the numbers, but if you want to do any kind of um, statistical analysis, you will find that Excel is limited. And what you will tend to also find is that your data isn't quite in the right format for the analysis. Um, 
so I would encourage you to learn how to use this, Ex understand the data input and just input your data into S SPSS. Because then if you want to do some analysis on it, it's very, very easy um, in, X in, in SPSS. And if you want to output the data in a format that you can use in Excel, you can do that. It's more complicated going from Excel to SPSS than it is going the other way. That's a practical note. Okay, so this is our SPSS uh, page with data in. What? Let's just uh, have a look at what we've got here. So this column, I've identified just a unique identifier. So here, as I've gone and, or the PhD student has gone and questioned um, individuals from this planet, it's just assigned an ID the first one they question was number one, number two. It's always useful to have a unique identifier uh, associated with any measurement that you make or any information that you acquire, because you never know when you will need uh, you need, need that, and you need something that's completely separate from uh, the experiment that you've undertaken. So it's a good practice just to have unique identifiers, whether it is just the, the sample number uh, or the specimen number. And that can be, uh, if you're doing work with patients, that's often just that uh, you can use a patient number. And here are the variables, height, weight, age, gender. And what you'll see under gender is I've got zero and one. That doesn't imply that one gender is more important than another. Um, it's simply what we call coding the data. So we have male or female. In this case, um, perhaps we landed on this planet and their gender is not defined in the same way as it is um, on this planet. And maybe there was a third gender or something, um, something like that. But the, here, we, so we've coded it. We said, okay, zero, one, possibly two, but zero and one we've got here in the data set. Now, if you go to at the bottom, you'll see uh, this tab called variable view. And next to data view, you'll see that you've got variable view. If you click on that, you'll see this rather strange layout like this. So remember, the variables are the things that we're measuring. So in this case, our variable names are height, weight, age, and gender. And we can specify some information about these variables here. So these are all numeric types, they're numbers. We're gonna input numbers. SPSS is expecting numbers. Width is just the number of characters that will fit in a box, just ignore it. Um, decimals, again, it's just the number of decimal places that will be displayed in the box. 
for most um, things you can ignore it. That is except to say um, there's a note on precision here uh, that when um, we're recording data, let's say like height, we would tend to record height to say the nearest centimetre. So don't write height down to the nearest nanometer, um, or even the nearest millimeter would probably probably be too much. And so this note of precision is limit the number of decimal places to something that makes sense for the measurement that you're making. Don't use 10 decimal places because um, that's what you got on the computer screen. When you get 10 decimal places on the computer screen, that's because the computer can compute things to that uh, number of decimal places. It doesn't mean that they're meaningful. So here you'll see that height is recorded to zero decimal places. Recorded height in centimeters, which is indicated by the label here. And it has been, um, I don't know why weight is in centimetres, incidentally, but um, now we're going to put weight in kilograms. There you go. And you can do that too. And so that's been uh, recorded to 0.1 of a kilogram. So what we have in this column, the label, this is a human readable label. This is a description of what this variable is. So. Uh, when we hear name is something that the computer can understand. So actually, it does, it, we use some, and it can't have spaces in it. So we use height, weight, age, gender. It doesn't have spaces in. We can quickly read it. But if we want more information, we type, uh, we can type in a, a real description there, height in centimeters. We could say height of individuals sampled from the planet in centimeters. And there's some other things here, and again, you can go and read about what all of these other columns mean. The one that I want to mention is measure, because this pertains to the data types. So we have um, some different data types. Generally speaking, we can have we we can define two two broad data types of categorical variables and quantitative variables. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But a categorical variable basically is a category, and a quantitative variable is something that you can actually um, measure. In SPSS, SPSS, uh, uh, SPSS, we have two different types of categorical variable called nominal and ordinal. And Quantitative variables are just called scale variables. So if you think scale, these are measured on a continuous scale, so weight, height, age, they're measured on a continuous scale. But gender and um, the identification number, their number doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so zero and one for the gender it doesn't matter whether the one comes before the zero or after. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to add in, uh, for the coding of gender, we're just going to add in a description of what the zeros and ones mean. So what you can do is you've got this values column, and this is where you can describe what the zero and the one mean. So go to the values column and the gender row, You see, if you highlight the box and click on the, the little was it three dots to the side, you should get a box that comes up like this that says value labels. And so in value, we can put in what our coding is. So in, in this case, this is coded as zero value. And then in the label, what does the zero mean? So it means male in this case. If you press 
add, you should get zero equals male, which might make some people smile. Um, this is not a test of equivalence. It, it's just so it happens to be how the coding was done. And then we can repeat this and we can put in the value of one and a label of female. And that might make you gain. So hopefully you have a box that looks like that. And you can remove and change like, uh, and uh, these. But if you've done that, you have just coded the data. Now we press OK. Then we can go back down to the bottom left hand corner and press on the data view. So if you've done all of this, value labels, looks like this, press OK, and go back to the data view. You'll see the gender column, you may have it still looking like this with zeros and ones. But if you press this um, button here, value labels, it suddenly changes to our coding. So we can look at our data and it, it makes some sense. We can read it. If you miss some of this, just uh, liaise with uh, the people around you and hopefully you'll find someone that followed and managed to achieve, achieve this. Or ask Saba as well, she, she's there to help. Let's give people a moment to catch up. There's no time drinking Dr. Pepper but, um, with the strap line, what's the worst that could happen? Probably not what you want to hear in a um, statistics lecture. Okay, so we have this data. Now let's um, try and visualize something about it. So one of the first things that we can, we can look at is whether there is um appears to be an even distribution of males to females so what we're going to do we're going to visualize this in a histogram and the great again the nice thing is that spss can do this all for us but we do need to understand what uh, the uh, the histogram is so histogram histogram is a visual representation of the number of occurrences of uh, of something that we're counting. So in this case, if I were interested in how many males there were and how many females there were, I could visualize that using a histogram. And in uh, the, the language that we use is we say it, the, the number of occurrences is called the frequency. This confuses engineers because frequency um, if you're an engineer, is things like radio frequency, uh, and it has a completely different meaning. But you're not engineers, you're generally speaking dentists, so you don't care. So what we're going to do, if you press then on graph, and you have this magic option at the top called the chart builder. So we're going to press on the chart builder, and you should get a box that looks a bit like this pop up. Now in the gallery down here, you'll see there's an option that says histogram. And so the software can automatically produce a histogram for us. So I'll just show you again for anyone that missed that. There's a graphs menu. If you click on the graphs menu, 
The top option is called the Chart Builder. And when you click on that, you get the Chart Builder dialog box. Now, I have a real preference for showing data and summarizing data in graphs because I find that if I look at a graph, I can very quickly see the key information. It's a really good way of converting things. There is a, a bizarre tendency in um, medical and dental journals for people to put things in tables. I hate tables. Um, and most people do. No one gleaned information quickly from a table. You don't look at a table and go, oh, I can see the trends. You look at a table and go, I can't be bothered to read that. And so you never do. And so, uh, and there's a tendency to that, for that to then find its way into people's theses. So people uh, put in their theses several pages of tables. I would generally encourage people, unless a table has information that you're going to use directly in, in your discussion and you really want to bring out uh, specifics of a table, I would say stick tables in an appendix and put um, graphs in the main flow of the text because it's so much easier to understand. Of course, you have to work with the individual data that you have. But I really like being able to visualize um, data, and that's what a graph allows us to do. So let's click on the histogram. You see this first one here, this brownie colored one. You can hold down the mouse button and drag it into this box here. So you should just be able to under his, select histogram, hold down the mouse button on that first brown bar chart and drag it up here and then release the mouse button. And you should get something like that. And so you've got a basic histogram. But of course, SVSS doesn't know what data it's going to put in there. Fortunately, we can use exactly the same uh, mechanism. We can say, well, on the x-axis, this one here labeled x-axis, we can take gender, because we're interested in visualizing how many uh, occurrences of each gender there are. We can hold down the mouse button and just drag that and drop it by releasing the mouse button onto the gender axis, onto the x-axis. And you should get something that looks like this. And you'll notice that here the y-axis has now changed to say count. It's because we've told it this is a histogram and it's going to tell, tell us the count of males and females. So if you've managed to do that, then you can press OK. If you wait a little bit, you'll see there's this new window opens up, which is the output window. And you should get a plot that looks like this, that you can cut and paste directly into your research article. And so what's the first thing? We're in our results section. What can we say about this um, graph that, we've, that we see in a results section? Does anyone want to offer? Excellent. There's more females than males. And it may seem, seem crazy that we're writing this down because it's so blindingly obvious. But actually, this is part of the scientific method and process. It's about breaking everything down and keeping it simple. Um, if we assume that everything is implied, then actually it makes reading research articles incredibly difficult and boring. And um, it means we're open to misinterpretation. So write it down. Write down what you see. There are more females than males. Saba. Okay. 
Thanks, Sabah. So just uh, in case you missed what Saba said, she was saying that this could equally apply in a, a laboratory situation. For example, if you're looking at different materials uh, and you, perhaps you're looking at the quantity of different materials and then you could uh, display that information in this way. So we have uh, this quantity of each material and then you would write down exactly what you've seen um, in, in, your, in your work. So there you go. Now, we don't want to stop there though. Um, firstly, when we're, when we're thinking about how we're going to apply this in our discussion, we might already be thinking, well, is this reflective of really what the population of Tatooine's like? Is there this uh, significantly greater number of females? Maybe I should use the word substantial because significant has a, a defined meaning. Is, uh, uh, ha have we looked at enough um, samples? Is it representative? Or have we looked at enough specimens? Is it representative? Um, well, we've got 10 measurements. How would we know? Well, let's just take a look at uh, some other things that we can do. So if we go to, we, we can look at the descriptive statistics. So last week I mentioned uh, st uh, dis basic descriptives, meaning the mean and standard deviation as good basic descriptive statistics of a set of data. So let's look, if you go to the analyze menu, and you see you get all of these options and this allows you to do all sorts of fancy analysis. So when someone says to you, oh, I think you need to do a logistic regression, what they actually mean is I have no idea what logistic regression means, but there's a menu option in SPSS and you can go and press that. Actually, they don't quite mean that. They do mean it's actually fairly straightforward if you know what it means and know how to use it. So you go to analyze, we have helpfully named descriptive statistics sub menu. And then on that sub menu, we have an option called st uh, descriptives. So analyze descriptive statistics, descriptives. If you click on that, you should get this box come up. And so we can choose um, which variables, height, weight, age, gender, we're interested in to get some descriptive statistics. Well, let's for now look at the height. Um, it would be meaningless to put gender in here because what would, if, if I said to you, well, what's the average gender on Tatooine? Does that mean anything? The average gender is 0.25. I mean, it's just completely, it's a categorical variable. It doesn't have a, a, a defined average. So we're not going to look at um, this uh, at gender as having a, an average. It's, a, so it's a, a nominal categorical variable. So let's look at height. So when you select height, then you can press this arrow that shunts it across into the variables list. And so this is the list of variables for which you would like to uh, look at the descriptives. And if you click on the options uh, button, which is at the top right of this dialog box, then you can choose what descriptives you'd like to see. So here I've, I've got the mean checked, which I think comes up as default. The only one I'm going to add to this is the standard error of the mean. And we're, we're going to talk about this in a moment. So if you press that and then press on continue, we return to this box and press OK. And you should get a table like this and you need to get used to seeing these kind of tables and knowing what's 
what it's showing you. So descriptive statistics, we have the minimum and maximum. These are just the minimum value and the maximum value in the data set. So the minimum height recorded is 140 centimeters and the maximum height recorded is 194 centimeters. The mean is 165.74. And it has this thing called a standard error of 5.7 and a standard deviation of 18. Um, I think, okay, well, these are numbers. And then we might like to think a bit about what, uh, what these things mean. But before we do that, I'll just leave it uh, to you to do exactly the same process of um, getting descriptive statistics, but do this. I was going to be for weight. Sabah wants you to do it for age. You can do it for age or weight, doesn't matter. Yeah, do both of them, but just oh, the degree or it will be continuous variable. Continuous variable, for example, you want to know the age of your sample group, what is the mean value. For example, if you have a children in year six in a school, you want to know what is the mean, what is the average age of those children in school. Exactly. If you, for example, have a different gender material, for every, for example, type of different gender material, you don't need to know the weight for every sort of material, what is the mean value for it. This is for continuous variable. For category, as I said, for example, the number of eyes in class, tall or short, and so on. So, uh, Dr. Bish has shown you how to do, for example, the categorical data for male and female, and the way stated as well for the weight, for the height, the weight for the height. height. And now just how to set the size for age and weight in order to set the size of the test. So have a go, have a play, um, and then once you've done that, we'll take a break for five or ten minutes. Um, there is bagel bunnies just around the corner. I believe they serve bagels and coffee. So feel free, once you've had a play um, and uh, generated some of these descriptive statistics tables and perhaps a histogram, maybe a, I know, histogram of for age. Just play, play, with, the, play with these tools. And if, once you feel comfortable with them, do feel free to take a break. Okay, the first thing 
Then, if I want the height, I would need to drag it here. What you, what the lady was saying earlier, she said if you want to have two categories, height and age, she said. Uh, for now, just look at them independently. So just create a graph for, create this one, and then just create another one for um, age. Oh, so you just put it there, let's say. Yep. Yeah, make two different. But if you want to have two categories, you, you can do that. Um, you can say, say if you go, click, if you drag that one up here, it's a great example. And, it, and you put H here. Capital. What you could do, um, actually, I have to think about this. It start, it starts to get a bit more complicated when you start to do these things. So, um, put age up here. Um, oh no, you can't, because age is currently listed as a scale variable. Pop it. I this is you'll get. I mean, you, it's fine. You can mess around with it like this, but it's beyond what was asked. Okay. So you don't have to do <laughs> to do this. Really, just repeat what was done before, and see what works, what doesn't. Um, but this is. Trying to get multiple things onto a graph can be done, but it's it's a bit more tricky, um, and we don't need to do it at this stage. Yeah, uh, you would like to compare to variables, and you would like to have an 
well, let's say, let's say, uh, okay, um, let's say you're interested in, take gender, put that up here. What does this mean? Oh, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then put age on here. Okay, now press OK. So now you've got males here. And they seem to have, you've got more males down this end than you have this. So the males are tending to be younger than the, and then the females. This is a stack. It's a stack. So it just means. One in one in three. Yeah. Males yeah. That's what it means. Yeah. So it's just a way of visualizing that information. You can get it to, to put them side by side, but it takes a bit more manipulation. Um, if you go back to the chart builder. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I never defined this, this sort of from the grouping. Or yeah, it's, it, again, the, you can do, you can define it. The chart builder, when you choose histogram, just does that automatically. Um, and actually we do later on start to talk about how you can divide it up as you'd like to have it. And I think you can even, I think you can do it in this box, but I never do it that way. Uh, you, you might not do it in here. I think if you keep going down, see what the options are. Get a bar. Yeah, I'm not, I, I wouldn't do it this way, so that's why. The, have a, you, you can have a play and work out how bin sizes, there you go. I do it, you can do, um, there's a bin in option here under data, I think, which is the way that we do it. And then, yeah, and then you cut the data and bin it as you. Yeah, so we'd, that's what I try to get the two things together in that we, we use it so that we can interpret the out, output, but also we're learning how to use the software at the same time. You can do it. It's easier to put your data straight into SPSS than into Excel and then output it to an Excel file if you want it in Excel. There's a thing here, not the only reason. Um, it's because of the way, because this is structured around having variables and you don't always put things in that format in Excel. Normally in Excel you just have a table and you don't always have it formatted as you would like to have it formatted. Uh, yeah, um, you could, you, yeah, you, you could do this in Excel, but what you need to think about is how you might want to select subgroups out of this. Um, so sometimes you might want another variable in here for, I don't know, do they smoke or something like that? Yes, no. And then you can use, uh, an, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, you can do this in Excel, but SPSS forces you to think about doing things in the SPSS way. If you do it in Excel, you'll find, you almost always find that it's not quite in the right format. Um, so, but it's not impossible. There is a thing, uh, I think it's on the data, there is something called restructure. So I think the hardest people is deciding which will be your Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, it doesn't come up under descript descriptives for some reason. I don't know. Yeah, it does, but I, know, I just know it doesn't come up in that box. It's a bit annoying, but it just doesn't seem. <laughs> yeah, it's just worth thinking about um, before it can save some time, basically. Okay.
Oh, sorry. Yeah.
Okay, please do take the next, use the next five minutes to take a break and then we'll start up again. Well, some people have taken a break already. I have no one said anything. I can ask. Where were where were you? Okay. Has anybody found a lost USB key that was left in one of the computers? Um, if you've got it, could you see your hand up? Attendance sheet, is it going round? Ah, oh, there we go, someone. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I will, it, it will be recorded and uploaded, so if you want to. Yeah. Will it be on the same uh, on, the yeah, 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 it will be under there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, no worries, yeah. Right. Has anyone picked up a black and red USB key? Uh, if you see one, could you contact this gentleman here um, or bring it to me? It's there. Right. It's there. Did you find it? No, you didn't. Um, so, uh, if um, do you want to just take my details, just in case it, it, I can, or if I, in fact, if you, well, if you take mine, and then you can, um, you just got a, got a pen. Oh, if I to write my email address down, then you can um, email me, and I can, if someone has, because it might be that someone will find it later on. So, so not everyone's in here at the moment. Some people have gone out. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So email me after the lecture, and it it may be that someone will p pass it to me. Okay. Well, may, uh, could it be one of your friends has turned up and? Oh, okay. Okay. Well. All right. Well. I, ho I hope you find it. <laughs> Thank you. 
So if we think of two types, uh, we can think of a categorical variable and a quantitative variable. And a categorical variable, in its simplest case, we can have the nominal variable, which is like gender or color or, I don't know, you can think of some other category, uh, place of origin, hometown, type of material, uh, cell type, phenotype, and these are all categories. They're descriptors of some entity, but they, they don't have a meaningful order. So anytime you have a variable for which it simply has a description of what it is with no meaningful ordering, that is a nominal variable. But we can also have another type of category, which is ordinal. So we build on this, this idea of having a description, but this time the description reflects some kind of ordering. And this is often encountered in surveys and questionnaires. It's the kind of thing that Saba deals daily uh, with. So we can have, um, please rate this lecture from really good to outstanding. Um, I wouldn't give you any negative options. But of course, uh, you might have um, good, really good, really, really good, really, really, really good, amazing, I'll definitely come back next week. And we might decide that good is a one, and really, really good, or really good is a two, and really, really good is a three. But if I choose really, really good, and I say, well, it's a three, is that twice as good? Well, actually, the three wasn't a good example. The really, really, really good, which would be a four. Is that twice as good as a really good, which is two? Confused with my numbers of really, really, really? Count the reallys. Let's, <laughs> we do it a different way. We can count, count the reallys. We can say good is zero. There's no, no reallys. One is really good. Two is really, really good. Two reallys. But the point is, there's order there, so one is better than the other, so really, really good is better than really good. There's some kind of order, but actually there's not a defined interval between those. So you couldn't say that really, really good is twice as good as really good, because that would be meaningless. So there's order, but no defined interval. And even though you can code that in numbers, it's not really a quantitative variable. It's categorical. It's really dis uh, an ordered description. And then we have these quantitative variables. And under quantitative variables, we can have discrete variables where they have a defined interval. So um, two is twice as big as one. But it would be meaningless to say 1.5. We don't have that option. So they're discreetly defined. Um, if you're into quantum mechanics, maybe you can think about uh, that. Or that might be beyond the scope of this lecture. But it's a de defined interval, but the uh, values in between don't mean anything. So this could be the quantity of something, uh, like the, I don't know, the quant number of people. So you might count the number of people, but it would make no sense to say one and a half people. I know the size of families. Okay, the average size of the family in the UK, it used to be 2.4 children. Well, presumably no family actually has 2.4 children, so it's kind of, um, kind of meaningless. So you'd have that as a discrete value but the interval is, defi is defined. 
And then the most general type of quantitative variable builds on that further and is continuous. And I've called these, these are real numbers where you can have one point dot, 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 dot. And so there is a defined interval in that one value that's two is twice as much as um, one, but likewise three is twice as much as 1.5 and 1.5 is a valid value. And that's true of things like height, of age, um, of any, any form of physical measurement. Uh, Sab, did you want to give an example? Sab is very hot on the examples. So uh, she might come back later uh, with some examples. But those are our data types. And they're useful to bear in mind and they're the kind of thing that we need to know and be aware of. Uh, these also affect the kinds of analyses that we can do um, later on. Okay, so we've already talked about this. Um, so something, uh, this is just a way of recording some of those categories. So we've got gender and alien species. Now we have a female Wookiee, would you believe? Actually, in the Star Wars movies, that's a male. Well, actually, I don't think they say, but I, I, my assumption is that's a male Wookiee. Hey, who knows? Who knows the characteristics of Wookiees? You need to watch the movies to understand that. Um, so hopefully you produce some plots that look a bit like this. One thing that came up is uh, depending exactly what you did, you may on the y-axis have either had the word count or the word frequency. So in the first example where we looked at the number of males and females, we had the word count. And that is simply the number, the count. So we had four males and uh, six females. Then if you'd gone on and looked at, uh, I think, the histogram of height, it would have said frequency. Just think of that as the count. It's the number of occurrences. Uh, the reason it's slightly different is the gender is a nominal categorical variable. So it doesn't mean anything to have something between male and female, and actually the ordering of these bars is meaningless. So you could have the male bar that side. There's no implication having male to the left of female doesn't mean male is le less than female or anything like that. The ordering is irrelevant, this is nominal. And it's, um, they're discrete categories. Age, on the other hand, is a continuous variable. And so you may have noticed that, or high age, height, weight, all continuous, and you may have noticed that SPSS then had uh, the bars covering ranges, say from uh, 130 to 140 centimeters. And so then it, instead of saying the count, it said the frequency of um, occurrences of individuals that fit in that range. I would encourage you to think um, just in terms of frequency. It's a more generic, uh, more useful term, but it is the count. It's the number of occurrences. Here you'll um, see this information um, represented as a table. And we can do this in SVSS as well. So we've got the descriptive uh, data. I think we'll just generate these, um, these tables as well. I, I did say I hate tables, but sometimes you need them because people actually want to see what the real values were. So um, if we go back, well, let's um, just talk about this for a second. So we've got exactly the same information. Males, frequency, there's four of them. Females, frequency, there's six. Total, we looked at 10 individuals. And so this is just the percentage. It tells you um, that there's 40% versus 
ignore the valid percent um, column for now. And then it has the cumulative percentage, which it simply adds together the previous uh, number. So here we say 40 plus 60, it's 100 percent. And we can do this quite simply uh, in SVSS. So assuming you've still got your data open, and you can go back to the data window. Which looks something like that. And then under Analyze and under Descriptive Statistics, we have an option called Frequencies. So you can go to the Analyze menu, Descriptive Statistics, Frequencies, and um, let's just look at Gender. You can click on the statistics box to see what options that gives you. Uh, we can look at the mean and the median and the mode. The mean is the um, arithmetic average. It's add up all the numbers, divide it by the number of uh, specimens. The median is the middle value. And the mode is the most frequently occurring value. So in histogram, it's the tallest peak or tallest bar. Yep. So here we can go to uh, descriptive statistics, frequencies, Statistics, we have the mean, which is when we add up all of our measurements and divide them by the number of measurements. The median, which is the middle value out of all of our measurements. So if we took all of our measurements and we sorted them into a long list and picked the middle one, that would be the median. And the mode is the most frequently occurring measurement or value. So that's the tallest peak in our histogram, or tallest bar in our histogram. And you can tick all of these things, and, but we'll just check, check those ones for now. If we press continue, oh, and we'll put, we need to put something in there. So let's put gender, press OK. And we see that table that I had in the um, in the PowerPoint presentation on the slide. Okay, so this is this is just a frequency table, and it represents the same information that we see in a histogram, uh, but in tabular form rather than in graphical form. And this is information we've already covered. So you can go back to the slides and just uh, recap. And we've done this uh, exercise, so we're going to move on. So let's just take a look at a histogram of the height. So some of you will have produced this already. And like I, I mentioned, SPSS will, um, if you just choose the option uh, of a histogram and put the data in, it will automatically create these ranges and look at how the data fits in the ranges. So let's just go back. We're back in SPSS. Um, I'm going to go to graphs chart builder I'm 
and click on the chart builder. Uh, grab our histogram. Make sure that that's in the chart preview area. It's in there. And now let's look at height. So then what we can see, if I take height, click on the button, drag it, and then release the mouse button there, we can generate that histogram. SPSS will choose some ranges for our data. And we can look at the distribution of height. This is what we call the distribution of heights. What we mean is, where do we have more height, more uh, taller? What's the most frequently occurring value, for example? So the mode is between 150 and 160 centimeters. So we've got at least we've got three people out of our ten in that range. But we do have some taller individuals as well. And we can generate, um, we can make some observations from this plot. So we can already say that uh, the mode is 150 to 160 centimeters. The, we have, uh, a tendency towards taller individuals. And what I mean there is that there are more the taller individuals than there are shorter, if we consider, uh, if we're comparing relative to the, whoop, comparing relative to the mode. But we still have this question of whether the 10 that we've looked at, we're still look, only looking at those 10 that we, uh, individuals that we measured, and we're still wondering whether really they are representative of the population of the planet that we're looking at. But even so, this data has some characteristics. It has a mode. Uh, and it has a standard deviation that somehow describes the spread of the data. Some, some people may use the word dispersion. It describes the dispersion. It describes, we know that not everyone's the same height. So there's some variation in the heights. And this thing called the standard deviation quantifies that in some way. I think, um, we just analyze descriptive statistics. Descriptives, again, we should still have it like this. Make sure you, uh, you get the descriptives table up for height. Under options, select mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, standard error. Let's continue. Leave it up there. And what we want is just that table again that describes the height information. So when you've got that, press continue. OK. And you should get the descriptive statistics come up like that. And now we need to think, well, what does all this mean? So. We measured 10 people, but if we had measured some more, we'd find um, that the distribution changes. And we, we can do this if you, it was 50, it was 100. So if you go back to the QM Plus website, you'll see under lecture two that I have sample of a population, n equals 100, n equals 1,000, n equals 2,500, and an entire population. So that's the 
everyone on the planet. Let's look at the n equals 100. So if you click on the n equals 100 file and open that up in SPSS, you should get a data file that looks like that. And you can repeat the same operation of looking at the descriptive statistics. So once you've got this file open, uh, analyze descriptive statistics, descriptives, And we look at height again. You'll need to go back to the options button and recheck the standard error of the mean. That's SE mean. Uh, and for some reason, it unchecks it each time. Once you've done that, press continue and then OK. So that's analyze descriptive statistics. Descriptives, take height, press the arrow, in, get, so make sure the height in centimeters is in the variables box. Options, check SE mean, press continue. So just, that looks like that. And then press OK. And you'll get a new descriptive table, table come up. And what you want to, to look at here is, OK, we can see that the range has changed. So the range is the difference between the maximum and the minimum height that was measured. So when we only had 10, the shortest person was 140 centimetres, uh, and the tallest was 194. Well, now uh, in our new set of measurements where we've got uh, n equals 100, so this first column n is telling us the number of uh, measurements that have been made. So we have 100. The minimum is telling us that our new minimum value is 137 centimetres. So someone a little bit shorter has joined or has been measured. But the tallest uh, or the greatest measurement remains the same. It may be that we have more individuals in that height, in that height than um, we don't know. All we know is the maximum hasn't changed. But the mean, so this is the sum of all of the measurements divided by the number of measurements, has changed. So it's gone from 165.74 centimetres and it's now reduced to 162.54. And so we question, well, which is the mean of the actual population? So we've taken us two different samples and we've got two different means. And that's where this thing, the standard error of the mean can help us. Because this can tell us how good or how well our mean of our sample represents the whole population, so everyone on the planet. And just looking at it, we can see that by measuring more people, the standard error has got smaller. So there's, we now have less error in our measurement or our estimate of the mean than we have before because we've taken more measurements. And we can look at, when we look at the distribution, so this is a distribution. So when we had 10, well, we started with 10 people measured, and we could see it was distributed like this. We had very slightly more um, measurements here. As you take more and more measurements, 
you see you get this whole range. As we increase the number of measurements, you see that this tends towards a fixed distribution. Now this so happens to be what's called the normal distribution. And again, we did mention this last week. The normal distrib distribution is very helpful for these things um, for explaining data and understanding data because it is defined by a number of parameters. And those parameters are the mean and the standard deviation. So those two parameters define a normal distribution or a normal curve or a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian, a Gaussian curve or a Bell curve. They all refer to the same thing. They're described 100%. They're totally described by the mean and the standard deviation. And so these, if we have data that can be considered to be normally distributed in that that means if you take lots of measurements, it will produce this kind of bell shaped curve, then the mean and the standard deviation describe certain characteristics of that data. Um, here we go. So, just trying to find a nice, there we go. That's the plot I was looking for. So we have the mean that sits right in the middle of a normal distribution. So when you've added up all of the measurements, you divide by the number of measurements, um, if you've got enough of them, the mean sits right in the middle. So it is also equivalent to the mode and the median under um, the circumstances that we have a normal distribution. So for normal data, the mean, the median, and the mode are all the same thing. And the standard deviation, which in general terms describes the spread of the data, so it describes how far out this uh, goes, when it's normally distributed, if you're plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean, so it's again minus one standard deviation, plus one standard deviation, then 68% of your measurements will occur um, in that range. And that's a definition of a, of a normal distribution. So if you've got um, data that you can assume to be normal and you measure a standard deviation, then you, can, you know that 68% of measurements will fall within this range. So you don't actually need to take thousands and thousands, you only need to take a handful. And then if we go to two standard deviations either side of the mean, that will encompass 95% of all measurements. And we can look at this, um, what have I got next? Oh, three standard deviations, we got to 99.7%. If you remember a couple of years ago when they were looking for the Higgs boson, um, and last year the Nobel Prize went to Peter Higgs for the theory uh, behind the Higgs boson. So this is the particle physics um, done at the accelerator in CERN. They talked, if you, if you listen to the news reports, they talked about the discovery of a new particle being defined as a five sigma event. And that means that um, they were looking for a signal that when they measured it, they might get a, uh, a distribution of the measurements, but um, they were certain to within five sigma. So this is like out here. So they were, I don't know, pretty much 100% sure that this was a new particle that they'd found. And you think the three sigma is 
99.7 and I can't remember the statistics now but if it's five sigma we're talking one part in a million or something something like that um, and we can we can look at this from a practical perspective again in SVSS by downloading these other data sets so if you download the n equals a thousand data set it will open up like this and we do exactly the same thing analyze descriptive statistics descriptives look at the height add the se mean value press ok and you'll get a third table pop up with your n equals a thousand so that's your thousand measurements and here you'll see Okay, the minimum value has come right down from 137 to 25. And the maximum has gone up to 198. So the range of measurements has increased. Interestingly, the standard deviation is about the same. So we seem to have a pretty good estimate from only 100 measurements of the standard deviation of this um, uh, of this population and the mean it's come down again very slightly but what we see is this thing called the standard error of the mean has reduced right down so what this means is we're really quite confident that the mean that we've measured for our sample of a thousand people or a thousand individuals truly does represent uh, the population that we're measuring but we can quantify this under the normal distribution so we're assuming this data is normally distributed And what this means, so if you think the, that mean value that we've taken is an average of a sample, and we want to know, well, how well does, oh, hang on, how long have you been looking at a blank screen? No one wants to say, but 20 minutes. So you take a sample, take the average height, and then we're interested in knowing, well, is that, does that average height say anything about everyone else on the planet? And what we can do is we can construct these things called confidence intervals, and you'll see it called the CI. Um, and all they are is the mean plus or minus two standard errors of the mean. And that SE mean box that we saw in SPSS is this thing called the standard error of the mean. Some people write it as the SEM or the SE, I always write it as the SEOM. But what you need to know is if someone constructs a 95% confidence interval around a mean, what they're saying is that they're 95% sure the mean value that they're showing you represents um, well, represents the population from which it was taken. And it, the confidence interval specifies a range, and it says 95% of the time. If I take 100 samples from this population, 
95 of them will have a mean that sits in this range. We can hopefully, if I've remembered the order of the slides, So we have a mean, and we're saying, okay, these are the confidence intervals. So, well, with a, with a um, this is the mean of a sample taken from a population, and I know, or I'm 95% confident that the mean of the population fits in that range. And it stands to reason that that range gets narrower and narrower the more samples you take. Because eventually, you sample everyone. And so that range is infinitely narrow because it's just one value, because you've me measured everyone. And we're fortunate enough to have all of the information from Tatooine, so we can do this. So back on the web, we can download the entire population can do exactly the same, analyze descriptive statistics, descriptives, height goes in the variables list, options, check standard error of the mean, press OK, and we get another box come up. Now this is everyone on the planet, so perhaps they took a census and measured everyone's height. And we find this after doing all of our experimental work, measuring everyone's height. It's, but we can at least compare our values. So our sample of a thousand individuals said that had a mean of 161.81. Well, the true mean of the actual population of Tatooine is 161.53. So, okay, this is slightly higher, but if you take this value plus or minus two standard errors. So if you take 0.8 off there or add 0.8 to it, you've got a range of about 161 to 162 and a half ish. And you're 95% sure that the population mean would fit in that range between 161 and 162 and a half. And then when we look at the true mean, indeed, it does fit in this range. You can ignore the standard error in this case, because this is the population. So I probably shouldn't check that box. And the true standard deviation is 12.6. Well, the standard deviation of the sample was around 13 mark. So actually, this sample was quite representative of the um, population. And in fact, if we look at the n equals 100, in fact, even here, this was reasonably um, representative. But we can quantify how representative, because again, taking off two standard errors, um, so about 159 and a half to 165, we're saying that the population mean would fit and then all I've done is taken this two of this two times the standard error off of the mean and added two times the standard error to the mean and constructed that confidence interval, 95% confidence interval. And so then I'm 95% sure that the population mean fits sits rather in that range. So I'm still saying there's a 5% chance that it doesn't. But that was with 100, um, measuring 100 people. And again, the standard deviation is 13.3, which is a pretty good estimate of the true standard deviation. So the variation in the sample mirrored the variation that we saw in the, in the true population. So it's worth considering what a um, 
what a sample is actually telling you about the population that you're trying to measure and whether you can extend the measurements that you've made on any kind of sample uh, to explain phenomena that you see in, um, in the population at large. And again, that can be a population of materials or it could be a population of people. And this, uh, this idea of the confidence interval is related to these things called p-values that we mentioned last, last week, where the, the p-value is the probability of obtaining an observed result by chance. So we can say that, well, what was the probability that the mean value um, represents the population at large and that confidence interval um, helps us to answer that question. But just remember that the p-value is the probability of obtaining an observed result by chance. We're not going to worry too much about this question because this question is the kind of thing we're going to look at next week in um, hypothesis testing. Um, but there's one more thing I I want to do actually in today's session. So we've talked about looking at this data and um, looking at the descriptive statistics and how you might expect to see a table like this, and it already is telling us telling us something about what's going on. And we need to be familiar with this terminology and seeing the all of the measurements summarised in this way. What it also, uh, but what I also said is that under the assumption of the normal distribution, things like mean and standard deviation have very uh, quantitatively defined uh, meaning. But of course, maybe we're not sure that our, our data is actually normal. What reason do we have for believing that we have normally distributed data? Now, firstly, when we come to our discussion, we can say, we can add that caveat to any analysis that we've done. And we say, well, this, the limitation of my analysis is that it assumes a normal distribution which is fine and, and it, it needs to be done but also it's good to be able to justify why and so we can look use histograms to visualize the distribution of the data and so quickly we can say go to i think you might need to use window and select your n equals um let's go to the n equals 1000 data set If you're not sure, you can go back to the Current Plus website. Oh, hang on. This isn't good news, is it? So let's go to Graph Chart Builder, Histogram. Drag the histogram into the into the middle. We're going to look at heights. Put height, drag height down onto the x-axis. Hopefully, if you've done that, when we press OK, you should get an output window. There we go. and you should get something that looks a bit like this. I'm hoping. And so we can immediately look at the data and we can say, well, does that look something like that bell-shaped curve that we have imprinted on our minds from earlier, assuming that the computer hadn't um, blanked out at that, at that point? 
we can, I believe, even, there we go. So if you go, um, go back to graphs and chart builder, and this all should be as it was before. So you should have uh, the histogram in the chart preview area, the height dragged down onto the X axis. Then if you've got this element properties box open, if you haven't, you can click the element properties button there. And you'll see this checkbox with display normal curve. And if you check that and press apply and press OK, my hope, there we go, is that we get the normal curve overlaid onto our data. And so just by visual subjective assessment of this data, it looks normal to me. And there are more advanced tests and things that we can do, but actually just as a starting point, visually examining the data, using our brains, which are far more advanced than any piece of software, we can make a reasonable judgment that this data is normally distributed and we can probably convince other people that it is too. And therefore a lot of the um, analyses that we might do that relies on the normal distribution would appear to be valid. And that's a really good starting point and it's a good thing to talk about in discussion um, and show that we've even considered that our data may or may not be normally distributed. But of course, um, it is possible that we'd have non-normally or abnormal data. And the kinds of things that we can see when data is not normally distributed that might break the assumptions made under the normal distribution um, is that we can see tails in the data or humps. And we see that the weight of the data, so I'm talking about the weight, talking really about this peak here in the histogram, might be shifted away from the center. And we can see here that the mode, which is the most frequently occurring value, is actually different from the mean and the median. And when those three differ, and we see visually um, something that departs from normal distribution, then that might lead us to question whether we can use analyses that rely on the normal distribution. And we might have to think about other ways of doing the analysis. But we can make a lot of these uh, assessments, at least initially, uh, just by through visual examination of the data.